The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. had given me, even for Sundays as well, lately God says, you're going to walk in a new anointing, Dennis. And I'm not saying that in some kind of a bragging, but I have an inner knowing. And you know what he's doing? He's doing, in reality, a scripture that you can find in the Amplified Bible, Matthew 13, verse 52. It says, those who have been trained in the Holy Scriptures are like a householder who out of their treasure bring forth things that are old and things that are new, the fresh as well as the familiar. And so that's why you never want to say, I already know that, I already know that, because you can always go deeper in the Word of God because revelation needs to be not just directional, just like prophecy. I see a lot of people, they have directional prophecy, but you need dimensional prophecy. You need to be changed and grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God, layer upon layer, like paint on a wall that's been painted many times, layers upon layers. You want the Word of God to be written on the tablet of your heart, layer upon layer. Grow in the grace and in the, in the nature of God. Become that partaker. So anyway, uh, is much to my dismay, and I've said this often, as a baby Christian, I had a supernatural experience in being filled with the Holy Spirit to where discernment was as easy as breathing, uh, an awareness of His presence, a touching awareness of His presence. Uh, you've heard of Brother Lawrence who practiced the presence of God. But God basically, is, like I said to my dismay, I wanted to go instantly to Bible school. Isn't that what happens to a lot of people? Oh, the minute you go, Pow! And you go, wow, God is real. This, he really loves me. I wanted to go to Bible school, and God quite clearly said, no. And all of a sudden, I felt like, what? What's wrong? He said, I'm going to send you to the school of the Spirit. And to this day, 43 years later, the things that he taught me have only deepened over the years. And so I'm going to go back with the fresh as well as the familiar. There's a fresh anointing on some of these things. But I want to tell you something. He showed me and taught me, and I'm going to give you examples so that you can be mentored by the Holy Spirit himself. You know, Now you know God gave gifts unto men, and one of those gifts is apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers. So we need teachers. I always see people try to take one side of that teaching. But you have an anointing and shouldn't have anyone need to teach you. What does that mean? Do we, do we need them or not? Of course we need them. But at the same time, you have personal responsibility. And when God called me from my mother's womb, it was to, it was to reveal the glory of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, that was my message. I was purposed for that purpose because I saw heavenly minded people, but they were no earthly good. And so God was basically saying they've got everything they need on the inside. If they would become more God inside minded, they'd be in a lot better shape. That he's not a long distance phone call, that he's within and he's near and he never leaves nor does he forsake you. So I'm a young baby Christian. God says you can't go to Bible school right away. Although... I did cheat a little bit. He let me read anything I wanted to read. So I took the Baptist Bible School. I took the Assemblies of God Bible School. I took the Faith Camp Bible School. I took the Kingdom Camp. I took the Latter Rain Camp. I took, as long as I did it myself, right? He wasn't going to stop me. But all in all, the most remarkable things was what he taught me <clears throat> in my own spirit. And all of our books all of our books are coming out of primarily what he taught me in those early days. So here's, here's the one that I want to share today. And by the way, on Tuesdays, I feel like the world needs these messages so much. I'm gearing all of that on Tuesdays for, the to me, the best of the best, the things that changed the most lives over the years, the things that have a, a track record. And here's even what God did to me. 
just to prove that I wasn't in pie in the sky. He would give me a truth. Then he would require of me to ask how to cultivate that truth. And then he would have me look in hindsight and say, where's the fruit, Dennis? If that's a genuine word of the Lord, and if that word was cultivated properly, where's the evidence? And you should see the evidence in your own life. Isn't that healthy? That was part of the school of the Spirit, those three elements. I'm going to give you a truth from the Word of God. I'm going to teach you how to cultivate that truth. That's the how-tos that you're all so familiar with. But those how-tos need to be identified not as pie in the sky or theory. I want to see, and to what do you see change in your character, motive, or attitude as a result? Where's the fruit? Where's the fruit? Now, I want to take you on a little journey today of, of what God basically called cultivating um, the ear of a mystic. That word. By the way, we can't use that word now because they hijacked it. But one of the first tools that I got in my hands was an 1828 Noah Webster dictionary. And in that day, <laughs> a mystic was known as a person who had deep spiritual experience with God, deep spiritual experience with Jesus. It was one who enjoyed communion with the Spirit of God. That, they were called a mystic. And uh, now, New Age, just about any crazy thing can be called a mystic. All right? But God was basically saying, I'm going to give you an ear of a disciple, someone who's going to enjoy that relationship and have that relationship deepened, but I'm going to show you... Uh, seven different aspects of it. And you know what those seven aspects were? And I wrote it down. The Lord laid it on my heart that in the olden days when journalism was uh, objective, <laughs> doesn't exist anymore. So any young person hears journalism, they don't know what I'm talking about. But in those days, you were required to keep your opinion out, right? This is what they taught you in school. Keep your opinion out and tell us who, what, where, when, why, how, and what way did that happen? All right? God took me to the school of the Spirit and did the same thing with the Word of God. So of those seven who, what, where, when, what, I, how, <laughs> the first thing that he taught me and he mentored me, remember, he said school of the Spirit, so I didn't have a teacher teacher. Those came later. And quite frankly, the, one, the mentors that I had that came later, I ended up giving them my material to bounce it off because flesh and blood didn't teach me this, but the Holy Spirit. But then, like the Apostle Paul, went in the wilderness, but then he did go back and get the consensus of the brethren, you know, get a second opinion. And I had Bible scholars, I had uh, brilliant men that basically said, uh, yes, there's, uh, I don't see anything wrong with, with what you're saying. And it was like, but this is what I learned in the school of the Spirit. And the first thing was that he took me to Isaiah chapter 50. And I like to say that I was mentored by Isaiah chapter 50. But it was really only a couple of verses over a long period of time. Because remember, I'm going to give you a truth. Then I'm going to teach you how to cultivate that truth. And then I'm going to ask you and require you to show me, did it work? Is there fruit in your life? Did it work? You see, when Jennifer saw me minister to that lady, that was the first thing she said, this is huge. I'm tired of going on. She was trained counselor. She was an Elijah House counselor. She was a school psychologist. She had all, the, she, all of the counseling training. But she said, what you did was quicker. And it was quicker than all the counseling training that I had. Later, I just saw it all as being too complicated. I wanted to return to the simplicity that's just in Jesus and me. And we've even got children's books because I found out that most of the models that I had learned later on in life, I said, I understand them, but it's like no child would understand this. The terminology and the procedure is too complicated for a child. And I says, it should be simple enough for a child. And this is what the Lord taught me in the School of the Spirit. First of all, the what of the word. Remember? We're going to cover what, how, when, who, why, where, what is the way. The first thing he said was the what. 
In Isaiah 50, verses 4 and 5, the Lord spoke to me and says, I'm going to give you, Dennis, you personalize this for yourself, I'm going to give you the tongue of a disciple. Lesson number one was that I was going to get the tongue of a disciple. That means I was going to be a speaker. I knew I was called to preach. But in that tongue of a disciple, I was going to speak a word as a disciple. And lesson number one is I had to hear as a disciple because I was a talker. And God had to teach me in the school of the Spirit that when I would say, oh, God, I just read that scripture. Oh, there's a river that makes glad the city of God. And the anointing would decrease. And then I would shut up, and his presence would increase. I'm going, there's got to be a lesson in this. (laughs) Oh, a disciple. That means he's the instructor. I'm the listener. Oh, and they say, that's right, Dennis, you don't have anything to say until you've heard something. Oh, I get it now. I understood the what of the word. That was the primary thing, was Dennis had to learn how to be quiet. To speak a word as a disciple, I need to hear as disciple. And we know Matthew 4, 4, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So I'm saying I've got the whole counsel of God, but I really believe that I have a relationship with him, and this relationship is to be two-way dialogue. Therefore, he's got a word for me. So then I had to train my spirit that there was a word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And that word won't return void without accomplishing its purpose. That made it exciting then. I wanted that specific word, not just the general word. I studied the general word. I want, I have a relationship with him. I want a word from him. Now, the first thing that he taught me to do was to write down any word in the whole counsel of God that I was seeing in my mind's eye, hearing, or feeling that something I was reading had life on it. How many know what I'm talking about? Something had life on it. You're reading, and then all of a sudden, out of the whole counsel of God, something has, and write it down. And he told me to write it down and cherish it. Now, I have a problem with people who don't need feelings. Because to me, and some of the best evangelical teachers will tell you you cannot live by your feelings the problem is the baptism that I had cut through the feelings that they're talking about the baptism that I had was a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit a perception that can be felt you see there's there's feelings that are physical you stub your toe ow that's a feeling but there's emotional feelings hurt Fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame. There's emotional feelings. But there is inner knowings, feelings and perceptions to where you make a distinction or you distinguish. And quite frankly, you give me someone who doesn't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, and they're just born again, but they don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. You, you get them alone with me, and I want to ask them one thing. Do you treasure that born-again experience? Do you treasure it? If you don't treasure it, I really worry about you. Well, guess what? That treasure is a feeling. It's an inner assurance. It's a title deed. It's substance, and it's reality. Don't wash away someone's reality by telling them to suppress their feelings, and you don't need feelings. I've, I've ministered most of my Christian life to highly gifted people that were emotionally messed up. Limited. By messed up, I mean limiting all that they could be. So the what of the word was write it down. Now, I would write down a word. Some of you would have a problem with this mentally. You couldn't get your head wrapped around it to write down one word. What if he just said, uh, wells? I learned to shut up, write the word down, wells, cherish it that God, it had life on it, and I don't have to understand everything. But I honored him by writing down that little part. 
That was the what of the word. And that took time to learn to do that. But you know what I found out? I found out, just like people that take our 60-day challenge find out, I could look back after a week or two and I saw those little words that didn't have any application. Those little words suddenly became sentences and sentences became paragraphs. And suddenly there was a momentum and a purpose and a plan. Huh? But you've got to, you've got to be patient. We're going to get to that. So the what of the word was basically knowing that God had a rhema word for me and it wasn't going to return void, but I needed to write it down and, and basically honor him with it. That, that's the what of the word. And it's interesting, even in the Lord's Prayer, did you know that there is a, 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 an example of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew? There's an example of the Lord's Prayer. And this is something that I learned in the School of the Spirit and then had it confirmed in Scripture. Neither one applies that you tell them your situation. Isn't that interesting? The Lord, and, and they were two years apart chronologically. Neither implies that you tell God these two accounts being two years apart, our Father, thy kingdom come. Forgive us. Our, all of that. Gee, you know what's missing in there? Is you, well, what they do now, rant. That's, that's dumping and complaining and belly. There's no place for it in the Word of God. And what God taught me right off the bat, I thought I was out of balance because you know what I was worried about? I had already learned that there was all kinds of prayer. And I wasn't petitioning. And I was getting guilty. All my friends were asking for a refrigerator. They were asking for a car. They were asking for this. They were asking for that. But my God, according to this, already knows all that I need. I asked for more of Him. So crucify me. I never had petition prayers asking for stuff. And I'm not saying if you're asking for stuff, it's wrong. I'm just telling you what he taught me in the school of the spirit. And I'm glad if I had it to do over again, I'd do it the same way. I never asked for stuff. I asked for him because my God will supply all of my need according to his riches and glory. And in the Lord's prayer, I could not find any place where he was telling you about what you need. And, you know, like, well, let me tell you what a week I've had, Lord. No, wait a minute. <laughs> what well, was he sleeping? <laughs> All things are naked and open to the eyes of him. That's the living word. So it's like, actually, you know what he's doing? He's watching your response to all that happened this week. Let's see how Dennis deals with this. <laughs> Watch. There's my servant, Dennis. Sometimes he does it right, and sometimes it's, oh, yeah, yeah. What are you going to do? All right? Now, that revelation of what changed to something that you're very familiar with. And I have petition prayers. But you know what I found out most of my petition prayers are after all these years? It's for other people. I just didn't ask for myself. I wanted him. And I'm not going to change that. I think that's healthy. Now, the second element that he mentored me with in Isaiah 50, verse 4 and 5. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a disciple that I should know how to speak. What? You give me the word? You just speak it, right? No, no, I learned this one in the school of the Spirit that I needed to know how to speak. And it was when he gave me that word, I thought you blurted out right away. Later when I became a pastor, I saw people that got revelation, they blurted out their revelation, but I never saw any change in their life. And what he taught me in the school of spirit, there's revelation for information and there's revelation for transformation. You apply that word to you before you go giving it to somebody else. Amen. Cause it to be a reality and written on the tablet of your heart. There's nothing wrong with revelation for information, but he's basically saying if you would make a habit of applying it to you first, you wouldn't just be blurting out every new thing that came down the pike. Meanwhile, your life is a mess. 
He basically told me that the how of the word, which later became how-tos, that you are so familiar with in all of our material, and that's what we were known for, how-tos. But God basically says, I'm going to give you a word. I'm going to teach you to cultivate that word. And then you look for the fruit to see that that word has really taken. I'm going to mentor you with Isaiah 40, verses 4 and 5. I'm going to give you the tongue of a disciple, Dennis. But I'm going to give you the what, that rhema word, but I'm also going to tell you how to speak it. And how that word even works, because that word works for transformation. And I saw the process of the way the word was made flesh. And I got more in love with that word changing me than I did with decreeing and declaring it. And I saw that if you start with a choice, you have to consent, you yield, you obey, and it births something in you. And guess what? It usually births an attitude, <laughs> a God attitude. And then you birth that God attitude, and all of a sudden, that God attitude becomes his character, and you become a partaker. You own it. You become a partaker of that divine nature. Now it's not just a word. Now it's not even just an anointed word. But it's a word that you have cherished it. And when I discipled Jennifer, she had trouble with that word cherish. And, and she goes, well, what do you mean? And I'm going, well, you treasure it. You cherish Absorb it. And she goes, ah. Sometimes you just change the word and people catch it. She said, you absorb that word. That's right. That is God honoring when you absorb a word that he gives you. Now remember, all I may have written down on a piece of paper from yesterday was wells. Do you honor God by just coming like a child and saying, that had life on it? God is my teacher. It's his responsibility to instruct me and teach me where to go from there. Not me coming up with all my good ideas. Because I could do that mentally, couldn't you? You could start to impose all kinds of things. So God says, I've given you that rhema word to cherish it, to absorb it. And he says, then eventually, Dennis, how you will speak. I gave you what to speak, but how to speak it is it's going to come out of the abundance of your heart. It's going to be life message. It's not just going to be information that you learn from somebody else. We've got too many echoes in the church. They're echoing what someone else has said, but they've never really had it transform their own life. So the what of the word needs a how, doesn't it? How needs to transform how needs to be changed because the outworking of it then it came in all of a sudden that word is no longer ink on a page but it's him it's your value system now oh, then it's Jesus the living word that's my value system now not ink on a page but that ink on a page has application because I own it it's written on the tablet of my heart so now how does it flow out of me it flows out of me <clears throat> as my value system out of the abundance of the heart right out of the treasure of his heart bringing forth those things fresh as well as the familiar out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks well I hope the abundance is something good <laughs> because the overflow is going to speak make sure you know what's in there before you overflow right there's a difference between preaching an anointed word and ranting both come out of the abundance of the heart all right. <clears throat> now, God basically says, and here's what you're going to do. From that place of reality, <clears throat> it's going to flow out of you, and it's going to be an attitude. It's going to be a motivation, and that motivation and that attitude needs to be maintained. And this is, we've got books on this. How do you maintain that flow? You pray in the Spirit, maintains the connection. You can pray in the Spirit anywhere at any time. You can pray under your breath anywhere, but you maintain the connection. The other way you maintain connection that really rocked the church is when we taught that forgiveness comes from the heart, not the head. Duh. But forgiveness maintains the connection, and praying in the Spirit maintains that connection. And out of the abundance, it flows, and you will have an attitude. Remember, he birthed an attitude with that word coming in, but now the attitude is one of gratitude and gratefulness and thanksgiving and out of the abundance of the heart you see things 
from a different perspective, and that ultimately changes your behavior. When your behavior changes, write it down, Dennis, that there's fruit. There's fruit from that scripture. There's fruit from that word. So I had to know to cultivate my ear to hear. I had to know the what of the word, the how of the word. How did it work? How do I assimilate this? How do I communicate it out of the abundance of the heart? How do I locate it, meditate, cherish it, absorb it? But then when he taught that, he took me to the next school. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a disciple that I know how to speak. A word in season. Now, this was not an easy lesson. A word in season. He would give me a word. And I was mentored in a little, little Pentecostal church at, when I was maybe six months old in the Lord. Right after I'd been baptized in the Holy Spirit, I had something to say about everything. <laughs> and God was going to mentor me that the word that he's put in my heart, there is a season. <laughs> And I was operating under a different principle. I had learned in the scripture, if you use what you have, you get more. I think I was in overuse mode. <laughs> if you use what you have, you get more. Give and it shall be given to you. Press down, shake. Right? That's a good thing. But what I found out was that they'd be sitting in a little circle and the pastor would be doing a teaching. I would interrupt regularly with a revelation. And after I interrupted with that bubbly word that was coming out of my mouth, in here I would go, uh, I'd feel a thud. <laughs> Eventually I caught on that maybe what I had to say was good, but it was really bad timing. It was not in season. Can you imagine God taking two verses, Isaiah 50 and verse 4 and 5, and then spending uh, almost a year with me to disciple me and then never really give up on it? because he would continually fortify it. I was having a hard time with this in season. I can remember one time that I, discernment was so easy. I can remember one time a friend of mine, Sandy Culkin, was invited as a guest speaker in this church. And the young 20-somethings uh, young were supposed to be in a Sunday school class where he was doing the adult Bible study or something. And I wanted to go. And my teacher smiled and she was really mad here, but she smiled and said, Dennis, you need to be in your classroom. And I said, well, I, I wanted to hear it. She goes, you just need to be in your classroom. I said, well, you don't have to be angry. <laughs> and then I realized, I read her mail, yes, but you don't have to say everything you know. <laughs> that was a hard lesson. So I had to go back to the school of the spirit. And God said, what did you learn? You learn you don't have to say everything you get. You, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. That means, Dennis, in that little public meeting where the pastor's trying to teach and everyone else is patiently listening, you don't have to have a, an opinion every two seconds. Did you notice the thud after you talk? That anointed word, the thud? That thud was me going, you should have kept that one, Dennis, for a later time. In season. This is not the season. Anybody ever have trouble with this besides me? Yep. <laughs> All you talkers, you have trouble with this, don't you? And then it's, it's, it's like I needed to know the when of the word. And the when was in season. And God was taking his time showing me this is season, this is not season. Are you getting it, Dennis? You feel that thud? That means you spoke out of season. I don't care how good that word was. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. And someone that says that I can't, I can't control it is a liar. You're in deception. You can control. If it's really an anointed word, it's under his control. And if you're under his control, it's abiding. It's there. Now, the when of the word is I found out later that what I had learned by remaining silent, I was now able to track. Have you ever been in a conversation where you're tracking? You can do this to some degree even in the secular world. There's a conversation going on. There is a tracking. 
I'd say husbands and wives can sometimes finish each other's sentences. All right? That's tracking. But there's a spiritual tracking or a cadence to when something's going. And for someone with discernment, it used to really bother me when all of a sudden the person would be saying, and then there's the shepherd, and he guards the sheep. And another one says, yes, and he takes you by the streams. And then someone always goes, I think there's a spirit of homosexuality in here. (laughs) A radical departure from the tracking tells me that they're probably very independent. They probably have never really matured for corporate life. And if so, it's still too much about them and their situation. Even when we, have, when we invite people to come up and give a word, it's real hard to separate out. If you come up and give a word, we want a word that you have for this family, not what God was just doing in your life. Hmm? Not that that's bad, but do you understand the difference? That there is a season and there is a timing. Well, the timing is to share what God has for us as a family. It's feeding upon the riches of his word, feeding on the manna, and then decreeing and declaring out of the abundance of the heart. But that requires relationship. So we have the what of the word the how of the word, the when, not an easy lesson. And how many of you know that even the when of the word is I can tell when someone's open and so can you. That might mean sometimes you might go ahead and speak anyway and other times God might say save it. They're not open right now. Why don't you build a relationship and see if they're open at a later date? How many have ever tried to tell somebody about Jesus and it felt like the words were going, (laughs) you know what? If you were sensitive, you'd learn out that they're probably not the right season. And other times, and you usually give yourself credit, other times you're telling them about Jesus and they drink it in like a vacuum cleaner. (laughs) And then you think you did that all. You're, wow, that was pretty good. That stuff that came out of my mouth, wow, that that was really great. Well, that was the Holy Spirit, not you. And it had to do with their openness or receptivity. Learn not only to track, but learn who's open and who's not. Now, I wasn't open. I'm not saying you never speak when they're not open either might be the will of God for you to speak anyway. I had a guy that when I was unsaved, I was working on my machine, and I bent over, and I had a cross that my mother gave me on a chain, and it hung down over my T-shirt. And a guy walked by, and I, religion was the last thing I wanted. guy walked by and says, does uh, that mean anything to you, or is that just an ornament? Do you know I never forgot that for years, years. I didn't like it when he said it. But it sure made me feel guilty for a long time until I finally accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And the first thing that happened was I recalled that young man saying, does that mean anything to you or is that just a symbol? Hmm? Now, the when, in season, out of season, we're to be ready. Okay? But understand, you can tell when someone's open and when they're not open. Adjust accordingly. Speak the truth, but you may have to then hold back a little bit. Just say, enough's enough for that. I gave them the gospel. Now it's in their ballpark. I'm not going to keep pushing it. I tried to beat my mother and father over the head with the Bible. And as soon as God told me, you take care of my people and I'll take care of your people. You take care of my family and I'll take care of your family. And the minute I backed off and released, which sounded like abdication from my point of view, but God's telling me to back off. When I backed off, all of a sudden the Xerox salesman is witnessing to my dad. My mother's hearing this. Someone else is watching. My sister's watching Christian television. All of a sudden, you know what? God has his ways and means. But he says, you do what I'm telling you to do. Hmm? But I had to learn the when as well as the how and the what of the word. Now, here's the other one. Element number four, the who of the word. It says, the Lord God has given me the tongue of a disciple that I should know how to speak a word 
in season to him. Who's him? It dawned on me that much of what God does for you first is for the purpose of others. Get others oriented. It's not all about you. And it was kind of a, uh, interesting because I saw that the who of the word is, is basically comfort those who need comfort by the comfort whereby you were comforted. Well, if you weren't comforted, if that word wasn't applied to you first, it really doesn't have much anointing to help somebody else. You're going to be giving them the right answer. But if it hasn't comforted you in the presence of God, then you're probably not going to really have an anointing to comfort those because you've not been comforted yourself. So I saw that the, the who of the word was, was clearly to him, to others. And identify whoever God has placed in my sphere of influence and adjust accordingly in love. But the heart of Jesus will give you the eyes of Jesus. You will see the fields that's ripe. You will know, that you'll start recognizing divine appointments. I can tell a divine appointment that comes into the, into the church fellowship. I can tell that those that were sent, and some just went, <laughs> but, but basically there's, there's a move of the Spirit to bring people from A to Z. And they may respond and they may not respond, but they are given opportunity. And so everyone in your life gives you an opportunity. But then God messed with me on this one because I was thinking, okay, others, others, others. But then God said, I'm looking how you respond to others. Oh, you mean that slow person on the road? Mm -hmm. I placed that person on the road exactly where I wanted to. What I'm letting you see is how what's in your heart toward that other person. Remember? Out of the abundance of the heart. So I start seeing that the who God will place in your sphere of influence. By the way, if you start seeing coincidences with the same old person, pay attention to that. That's what God works that way. The same clerk in a grocery store, the same waitress, the same in a restaurant. If all of a sudden you're starting to run into the same old, same old, I believe you have a responsibility. I mean, you, could do, you can minister to whosoever, but I'm saying pay attention to divine appointments. Pay attention to those people in your sphere of influence. And to have the heart of Jesus, you want the eyes of Jesus, you've got to have the heart of Jesus, okay? That's the who, others. Now, that's element number four. So we've covered the what, the how, the when, the who, all while the Holy Spirit worked mercilessly on Dennis' flesh. <laughs> All right? Now we get into the why. Isaiah 50, verses 4, why? The tongue of the learned, so that I would know how to speak a word in season to him. To him who? To him who is weary. Isn't that what Jesus did when he came out of the wilderness? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointing me. Preach the gospel to the poor. They heal the brokenhearted. They set the captives free. And God always said, that's part of your life mission right there. Preach the gospel to the poor. Heal the brokenhearted. Set captives free. That's the ones that are weary. And trust me, we have many people that have a genuine born-again experience, but they're weary. They're in... They're, wore out, they're tired. They've not really learned to yield the will to the will of God properly. They're, they're weary from trying. But God says to him who is weary, we know the anointing. The anointing of God can break the yokes of bondages over people's lives. And God says basically, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And unless that's your experience, there's something you're doing wrong. And I know we don't like to be wrong, but if your yoke is, is hard and heavy and drudgery, there's something wrong. You're either into your own self-effort or the traditions of men or there's religious spirit on you, but there's something because it is not, it's meant to be joyful. I can't wait to come and preach, right, Jennifer? As a matter of fact, my, my dilemma is I have three messages and I can only give one. I'm going to get another one Tuesday. But these are life messages to me. 
This is the way he trained me. And this is the way he can train you. Now, how many people say, that's too hard, Dennis. That gives up. It sounds like that took weeks and months. Uh, do you have something else to do? <laughs> I've seen people roll their eyes with, and Jennifer's life was transformed after many years in Christianity in 60 days. 60 days. <laughs> you sound like me when I signed up and joined the army for six years. I was 19 years old, and I went into deep depression because I c calculated that in six years, I'll be an old man of 25 by the time I get out of the army. My life is over. I might as well quit. <laughs> None of you have ever done that. No. Uh -uh. But... The why of the word is for the weary, to heal the brokenhearted. And I really believe that everything that God makes real for us is for others. Fruit was not meant for you to enjoy. Fruit was meant for you to give away. Right? So what did he say? Dennis, I'm going to give you a word. Now I'm going to teach you to cultivate that word. I'm going to give you the how-to. But then I'm going to have you to maintain integrity with me, evaluate and see if there's any fruit to that word. Did that word transform your life? Did it change your life? Is your behavior different now? Is your perception different now? Do you see different now? That's the why of the word. God's basically saying, you know, people need tender, loving care, but they also need to know how to enter into God's rest. And there are many people that are not entering in God's rest. Many leaders that are highly gifted, but they're burned out. They're tired. They're weary. And God's given us a word to the weary. God's given you a capacity to teach them how to get their peace. Right? Remember, in this church, there's only two key answers. If I ever ask a question, just say forgiveness or peace. And, you, and there's a 90% chance you'll be right. Forgiveness and peace. But forgiveness must flow from the heart, not the head. And peace has to be the supernatural peace of God, not I want what I want and I got it, I got peace about it. It has to be a supernatural transaction. Now, the where of the word. No, this is important. Dennis, I'm going to give you the tongue of a disciple that you would know how to speak, a word in season to him, to him who is weary, I'm going to awaken you morning by morning. I'm going to awaken your ear to hear. And suddenly it dawned upon me that if he was awakening my ear, the place to do this was morning by morning. And morning by morning, he's saying that my spiritual ear is sleepy. Your spirit can be somewhat dull until it's incited to action. Until it's awakened, until it's aroused, stirred up. Those are all the same Bible words. Stir up, arouse, incite to action, awaken. All of those things mean you are not just sleeping, Dennis, in the natural, but the tender mercies of the Lord are new every morning. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. There is a demarcation of a single day. Give us this day, our daily bread. That demarcation has a a process, a, a preparation for a moment-by-moment -moment relationship for the whole day. And yesterday's word doesn't necessarily apply today. Okay, just like the man on the wilderness, right? It's good for the present. Give us this day, my daily portion of, of Jesus. Now, he would say, where? Morning by morning, I'm going to awaken your ear to hear. And again, what I saw was that the awakening must take place here. It wasn't talking about this hearing ear. And awakening my ear morning by morning, I would have to, and this is so key, this is so key, that the whole church, you need to memorize this. Most, I didn't say all, most supernatural is too quiet for your flesh. You miss out on the greatest adventure of a moment-by-moment -moment relationship because your, your flesh is too noisy. Mind, will, and emotions is used to being in charge. And God wants you to quiet that flesh. 
like a weaned child with its mother. That's still small voice. It's not in the earthquake. It's not in the fire, right? It's not in the wind. Where was it? In the still small voice. But the still small voice, he doesn't get louder. You have to get quieter. How do I get quieter than that noisy thought life? See, Dennis had to learn this, that while I prayed, I didn't pace. Because, see, I like activity. I had to pace while I prayed. God said, no, sit. Matter of fact, he had me kneel and where I wanted to talk, he said, you don't have anything to say until you hear something? Listen. There was things pulling at me like, I wonder if there's enough stuff in the garage to do an oil change later on. <laughs> or if I'm going to have to go out and buy. It wants to pull you away. And you have to go, no. You have to wean that's a good word. You have to wean your flesh like a wean child with its mother. I have quieted my soul within me. That's what David said. I have quieted. Most supernatural is too quiet for your flesh. You miss out on the greatest adventure of a moment by moment practicing his presence because you're too noisy. And if you can't sit still, you got to talk, you got to pace, or you got to think of some activity. Your flesh because I asked the Lord, how long do you want me to pray? And that was one of the first things he told me. Until you quiet your flesh, you haven't prayed. You haven't met me in prayer. Reading a daily bread, doing all that. No, no, no. I know all those habits. But a lot of that is for an active mind. I want your mind to be stayed on me. And until you quiet that mind, will, and emotions, you cannot perceive the communion and the supernatural unction that is there and available to you to where we can commune together relationally. So the wear of the word was basically morning by morning. Now listen to this. And then can you see the utter frustration? I'm going way back. I'm going back decades now. But the frustration that I had when I saw people going, we, had, we introduced the prophetic uh, in, in our church in the uh, uh, by 1980, and we got a lot of persecution for it. But quite frankly, even then, I was watching people go to conferences and wanting a prophet to give them a word. And there's nothing wrong with that, conferences or getting a prophetic word. But God was basically telling me that the same, you, it's, it's like the where of the word. Where is the word? He said, primarily, it's in your prayer closet morning by morning. If you don't have that one, you're going to spend the rest of your life looking for a word somewhere. When God says the where is here, Jesus the Messiah in you, the hope of glory. So I learned quickly that the where was morning by morning. As a matter of fact, I'm a heavy sleeper. Jennifer knows this. She's up always an hour earlier than I am. And she, that's what it sounds like to me. And I'm, and I'm go, I have no idea what you're saying. So, in other words, until I'm fully awake, don't talk to me. And when God was mentoring me, don't you think he knows that? Guess what I would have to do? He, I learned to acclimate to even the slightest move of his spirit, even when I'm a heavy sleeper. I would start to just wake up a little bit, and I'm still groggy, and I would feel like a feather of his love brush my spirit. And I knew he wanted to pray. I would put my leg outside the bed and let gravity pull me out was the only way I could get out. I had to rely on gravity. I had to rely on something natural. I knew God wanted me to pray, but oh man, it would be so much easier to stay here in bed. And I can still remember that. And I can also remember the, the, the times too when I didn't do that. And you felt remiss. You felt like you missed out. You felt like I'm becoming insensitive and callous. I don't want to harden my heart. I want to remain sensitive to the Lord. But I needed gravity <laughs> to get me out on the side of the bed to wake up, to commune with him. And it was, it was the most precious time. 
I believe people around the world could be mentored with these things if they took these, these simple little instructions in an Isaiah 50 verses 4 and 5. Just take that, but make it your own. Not mine. You can't have mine. You have to have your own relationship, but make it real. Answer the questions. Can you answer the questions? Who, what, where, when, how, why, what is the way? Children are intuitive, and here's what the Lord was developing with understanding the where of the word. He said morning by morning he's going to awaken my ear, but really what he wanted from me is a term that Smith Wigglesworth used, a babe spirit. And I'm going, I want you, you, you gave me a ministry to mature people, and I'm to mature, and you're telling me to have a babe spirit. Mm-hmm. Because basically what he was saying was that, I thank you, Father, that you've hidden these things from the wise, and you've revealed them to babes. So there was, in the wear of the word, he showed me that it was not only quieting down and morning by morning, but that he was looking for a intuitive, childlike, implicit trust. He didn't want me to go, I already know that. He wanted me to be like a little child. Because assuredly, unless you are converted and become like a little child, you by no means enter that dimension of the kingdom. What is the kingdom but love, joy, and peace? You say righteousness, peace, and joy. But righteousness is love and action, peace and joy. That's the kingdom of God. That's the God emotion. That's the touching that's the touching and perception of feeling God's presence in reality. Children are intuitive, but a babe's spirit is totally yielded and dependent upon an inner hunger to hear and to learn. This made me question whether I was remaining teachable or was I saying, okay, I already know that. He's doing it to me right now because he's he's. he's causing to boil up from within things that are old. But it's fresh. And he's taking the fresh as well as the familiar, and he's saying, I'm packaging this to disciple my people. Because now, all that you've learned and discipled and hopefully you've grown into can bear fruit exceedingly abundantly beyond what you thought or ever hoped or expected. A true disciple is one who give the tongue of a learned But I opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. So what he showed me is I'm looking for a babe spirit that doesn't rebel or turn away from the instruction. You know, you're going to obey somebody. You might as well get still and obey the voice of God. Because he will, that purpose will not return to him void. It's the, most, it's the safest place to live in a perverse and a crooked generation. The seventh and the last, and this one, he spent a great deal of time when he said that I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. He basically taught me that when God speaks his word, there is a way that that word works. Much of our material flows out of what God taught me in this portion of Scripture. What he says, what do I mean, God, I don't want to uh, uh, fight it, and I don't want to run from it. You know, in, in counseling, they'll tell you, right, Jennifer? Secular counseling, they'll say, there's fight, flight, and freeze. <laughs> I guess that's my word. Uh, but but you, either, you either freeze from fear, you fight back because you're afraid, or you run away and you're afraid. God says, I want to teach you the fourth alternative, and that is peace. And peace will crush the enemy beneath your feet. Peace will guard your heart and your mind. Peace will be triumphant. And that basically... You don't run from it, you don't fight it. You consent, you yield, and you obey. But here's what he showed me, and much of our material comes out of this. 
this precious word, Dennis, that I'm speaking to you, one of the most missing ingredients with the word of God and decreeing and declaring the word and prophesying the word, praying the word, all of that is valuable, but one of the most misunderstood aspects of the word is how it works, the way of the word. You know, children of Israel saw his works. Moses knew the ways of God. And here's what he did. He took me to Jeremiah 1, Jeremiah 1, verses 9 and 10. The Lord God says, he put his hand on Jeremiah's mouth, and the Lord said to him, Behold, I put my words in your mouth. This day I have set you over the nations and the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. We just jump to the build and the plant. We fail to recognize what the Word of God, how it really works in our lives. And before he can build or plant, he's got to prepare the soil of the heart. And I looked at this, and I guess it alternates between planting and building. But he basically says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, what do you see? I see a branch of an almond tree, a waking tree. You have seen well, Jeremiah, for I am about to awaken my word to perform it. And God basically is saying, awaken, incite, uh, arouse. Uh, here is the pattern that God used from that day forward. He says, first of all, Dennis, that precious word that you wrote down in your journal, that what? That what is supposed to, first and foremost, root out. Root out from the soil of your heart anything that's contrary to it. Oh, I know you want to plant that word in you, but if there is a, a wound or a lie in you, it needs to be rooted out. To root out evil out of the soil of your heart, that word will root it out. It will, it will pull it out. Beware lest any bitter root of bitterness spring up in you. Pull down. That word will pull down Seats of authority, altars, idolatry, strongholds in the mind, that word will pull down. So it will root out the evil in the heart so that the soil of the heart is being made ready. I will then also take and bring down seats of authority. Thirdly, I will destroy, I will corrupt the soil. I said, well, corrupt the soil, corrupting the soil of the heart so that no weeds can grow there. Kind of like weed and feed. <laughs> I will prepare your heart so that only good things grow 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold. Throw down. I will throw down like those walls that have been built up as strongholds, I will throw them down and I'll build something beautiful on the top of them. Then he says, I will plant and I will build. You could plant a garden. Don't you have to pull the weeds out first if you're really going to have a successful garden? And I saw from that point on that we've minimized the word with repetition, even vain repetition, without proper application, without the cultivation of that word, without it cultivating our heart to, so that the soil is good to reproduce. We're real good at saying the right answer. We're not real good at absorbing the right answer until it transforms us, and then out of the abundance of the heart say it. Does that make sense? But Jeremiah 1 did it for me when I said the way that the word works. I have to see that that word will root out, pull down, destroy, throw down, then you can build and plant. I don't want to build on sand. I want to build on a sure foundation. Amen. So I'm going to have to, any, any philosophy or any ways of thinking that have built up in my mind and in my, lie, some, in my life some lies, I want those things to be brought down. So now you have it. How many know all the, the words, the seven areas? How many are going to, try for one day <laughs> to go through all seven. If 
Father, we just pray for Isaiah 50, verses 4 and 5. If that was good enough for you to disciple me over the long period to make real in my life, how much more could you disciple the nations and teach them to draw nigh unto you and understand what the word is, how the word works, when it is proper, who it's it for, why is it there, where do I find it, and how is the way that it actually works. And then answer this with every word that you get from this day forward. That truth, did I cultivate that truth? Is there fruit that that word has actually taken root in my heart and life? Am I, is God building something? He said, I'll build my church. You're his church. You're his congregation. That's a better word than church. You're his congregation. And he says, I will build my congregation. Are you allowing the word of God to be built in you? Or are you merely repeating what you've learned? Are you an echo or are you a voice? God's looking for voices. Out of the abundance of the heart you speak. And decree and declare. Father, seal this work by the power of the Holy Spirit. Create in us a hunger and a thirst for a babe's spirit to receive with meekness that engrafted word that is able to save our souls. In Jesus' name, You've amen. been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.